And thank you everyone for coming today and thank you to all of the panelists for participating. We've got a fantastic panel up here today, incredibly talented. Um, and we're gonna talk about all things that are happening or not happening in wireless when it comes to Capitol Hill. So we'll do some quick round of introductions. Uh, first, we've got Robert Fisher. He is the Senior Vice President of Federal Government Relations at Verizon. Next, we have Catrice Banks. She is the Vice President of Federal Affairs at AT&T. Third, we have Jeff Blum, Executive Vice President, External and Legislative Affairs at DISH. And at the end there, we've got Christine Kurth, Director of Federal Legislative Affairs at T-Mobile. And I will say, uh, I think among all of us, we probably have uh, north of, I don't know, 70 or 80 years of Capitol Hill experience <laughs> sitting up on this stage right now. So you'll get lots of really interesting answers and questions. Um, we've got some congressional staff who are actually with us here today who will no doubt tell us if we screwed anything up today at this panel. So anyway, let's get going. We're gonna obviously going to start with Spectrum. It's been the issue du jour, certainly one of the big issues at Mobile World Congress. And I, we've said this a number of times today, this is like the first time the FCC has lost auction authority, which I frankly didn't ever think would happen. And it, you know, it happened. So let's talk a little bit about the consequences of that. Robert, why don't you get started on sort of what do you think are the consequences of the US losing auction authority? Sure, thanks for having us here. I guess with the combined uh age you're saying of experience, you're just saying I'm old. But, well, you know. we're all old. Yeah, yeah, we're, <laughs> um, yeah so I think um, having, you know, Spectrum Auction Authority actually lapse is, um, it's, it's quite tragic. I mean, for all of us who've, um, and it's funny because all of us up here have worked together for so many years, even though we're all competitors, we've worked together uh, professionally for a long time. And it, it's kind of unimaginable that it would actually happen. And, um, but like anything else in Washington, I think we're dealing with a lot of dysfunction these days. And um, it's not for a lack of trying to make it happen. I think it's just the lack of understanding, I think, between a variety of the different parties, which includes the federal government, um, has kind of led to this position we're in right now. But I'm really hopeful that, you know, common minds will come together and be able to figure this out. I think it's, um, I don't want to say it's easy to figure out, but I think it kind of is in a way. It should to, be. It should right? be. It should be very easy to figure out, um, and it's it, it's really not political. I think it's just more of the issue sets that we're dealing with, and so I think we have to start bringing together all of those parties. We're obviously aware that there are several kind of reports that we're waiting on. I know that um, you know we, we've also got the National Spectrum Strategy. We have this PAS report that's coming out. And so I think once those come out, hopefully that will lead to greater discussions in a pathway forward to find us um, some resolution on this, and I'm, I'm hopeful that can happen. Fingers crossed. Uh, Catrice and Jeff, I'm curious, when you're on Capitol Hill talking to offices, members, and staff, do you think they appreciate sort of the, the importance of this internationally for the United States when you're talking about auction authority having lapsed? Um, I would say intellectually, I think that when we have these one-on-one -on -one conversations, um, folks do have this fond appreciation. I think it's probably hard for a lot of the staffers who hadn't been a part of these previous um, reauthorizations to sit here and say something that should have been so simple and has been simple before in the past has all of a sudden turned complex. And I think Robert said it best. There are a lot of different equities that people are balancing on the Hill and a lot of different things. And I just think that we have to find ways um, here as an industry um, to work more closely with the Hill to kind of figure this out. Because I think one of the things that we've learned in talking to some of staff and members and folks like that who are especially haven't been around since the past um, reauthorization is this, that, you know, Building spectrum takes planning and time. It's a seven to a 10 year process. And if you don't have that authority to kind of make those things and make the plans happen, the constituents and others um, are not gonna reap the benefits of what they hope to gather and keep doing what they, what they do with the daily lives with their cell phones. So. And before we criticize Congress for not <laughs> restoring spectrum authority, not getting rip and replace done, not solving lower three, I do want to note, last Congress, Congress actually did a lot of things uh, that yeah. we've talked about. $42 billion of BEAT, ACP, $1.5 billion for ORAN grants. So Congress is certainly capable of doing telecom policy that is bipartisan, 
uh, that has a claim uh, that will put us on a path for leadership, but in discussions with staff, we, they tried mm -hmm. to get it done. And now there's sort of a sense of embarrassment. Like, I don't know, like we tried and we can't get it done and there's this frustration. I'm optimistic we'll get it restored in the next few months, whether uh, it's restored as a standalone or whether uh, three, lower three is part of it, which I'm not optimistic about. Uh, but it's going to happen eventually. But heading into WRC without it is certainly a negative. Look at you, glass half full. I love it. Try to be optimistic. Um, Christine, obviously, Timo's in a really interesting position. I say interesting. Yeah. Uh, given your 2.5 licenses you've paid for but can't get access to, uh, what's the path that you see for T-Mobile on these 2.5 licenses? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, you, you initially started out asking what, what are the consequences of, yeah. of lapse of uh, authority. And uh, since this lapse has never taken place before, there are some uh, consequences that no one foresaw, and one of those is uh, the harm to consumers because of the fact that we have not be been able to have access to our licenses. Uh, the FCC has not granted our licenses, which T-Mobile which won over a year ago now. Uh, T-Mobile won 7,000, over 7,000 actually, licenses, and the licenses are located in every single state plus Puerto Rico. And uh, it's, it's a shame because uh, the, the lack of this grant of, of our licenses um, prevents millions and millions of consumers to having opportunity of uh, better, improved, expanded access to and service. So uh, this is also something that would allow for, in many instances, um, more opportunities for access to in-home broadband, which I know a lot of folks are interested in for many reasons uh, in many parts of the country. Um, and the reason why is because the FCC leadership has determined that they do not have the authority to grant our licenses that we already want at auction while this lapse occurs. Now, I will point out that um, others disagree on that interpretation, including senators and members of Congress on both sides of the aisle. So, uh, so but what does that mean? That means that our licenses are still stuck. Uh, so going to your, your point and your question, Kelly, uh, we are super um, encourage that there's a tension on the Hill uh, to try to address and clarify this interpretation and the, you know, the confusion between uh, what the authority is. So, uh, so we're hopeful on that front. Um, and then I do want to mention two other points um, that are unique to this situation. Uh, one, oftentimes on the Hill, uh, bills are passed, and then there's implementation, which naturally takes a long time. And so consumers might not see the benefits in the district or the states uh, for a while. But this situation is unique because T-Mobile actually has prepared our towers. So uh, once the licenses are granted, um, there'll be flips of switches. And then within days, consumers can see the benefit, not months, not years. So that's pretty unique when you can see something in action in, in DC have the benefits out uh, in the uh, homeland so fast. Um, the second point I wanted to make is has to do with what's been looming around a lot um, is uh, the attention that DC is uh, focusing, and quite na naturally, uh, a lot of folks in the country are focusing on is government spending. Um, in the past, as um, was mentioned, billions and billions of dollars have been appropriated already for broadband deployment, um, but there's uh, some members of Congress that now are scrutinizing how that will be spent and um, how it can be spent wisely. Um, this situation, again, is unique because this will be broadband deployment uh, without uh, federal subsidies. Um, as Kelly, you mentioned, we paid over $300 million to the federal government, and so we are uh, waiting uh, for this to be resolved so we can have access to these licenses and benefit consumers all around the country. Well, hoping it happens quickly. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> um, there's been a lot of conversation over the last few hours about a pipeline and the importance of creating a spectrum pipeline. And honestly, this has been something we spend a lot of time on Capitol Hill talking to members about the importance of legislatively creating a spectrum pipeline. Now, um, when you look into the future, uh, everybody pull out their crystal ball. Um, do you see Congress doing anything when it comes to creating a pipeline? And what does that possibly look like? Robert? Yeah, um, the answer is yes. I think <laughs> I, I, I'm certainly hopeful. My, uh, my colleague, Will Johnson, kind of mentioned this on his previous panel. Uh, there's a lot of spectrum that's, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that's available out there. 
and, and we know that it will be synced for, for mobile use you know, worldwide. And so I, I, think there's, I think members understand that without question. We've done so many, I mean all of us have done so many me, uh, meetings with them. I think it's just a, a, a challenge of kind of getting beyond this hump of auction authority and then really establishing the fact that we do need a spectrum pipeline. And I know it was mentioned previously by you know, Deputy Chief Bonner and even uh, Commissioner Starks too about the need for having you know, a pipeline of spectrum because when you look at what's happening across the world, when you look at what China's allocating, it's, it's clearly a, a, a position of uh, economic and I think national security risk every day that we delay not doing something on spectrum auction authority and a pipeline. And so um, we also know that that hockey stick is real and, and the data that consumers are using. Um, <clears throat> no better example than Taylor Swift breaking the internet over the weekend um, <laughs> and, and really seeing how, you know, how everybody's using it today that the use is just you know, off the charts. And so I, I'm very optimistic that congressional leaders on both sides of the aisle see that, they recognize it. And I believe that, that we'll get something across the goal line. It just, we might have to just go through a little pain at first, but I, I, I'm optimistic. A little we'll pain. There. A little pain. A little pain. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, we obviously have a House bill that, you know, has kind of been winding its way through the House process, got through a committee, um, you know, intending to make some spectrum available. Um, so I, th I consider that a good sign, sort of. Do you see that going anywhere? I, if you ask me this question, I think, look, I, the greatest thing about, I think, that House bill that passed out of the House is the fact that it was bipartisan in nature. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the fact that that happened that way, and you don't see that on a lot of issues, says a lot about the importance of what spectrum is and why we need it and why we need to use it. Um, it is my hope that this bill gets passed out of the House. I mean, I know that things are happening um, both in the House and the Senate where, um, where things that unrelated to spectrum are taking place, and so that proves challenging for folks. But for me, um, and I think everybody here, we, as you've said, over 70 years of experience sitting here on this um, <laughs> dais, I don't like to say that out loud, by the way. <laughs> um, I, think it, I think what you will get from that is the fact that we've always, whenever we've done anything in the telecom space, whether it's spectrum, um, ACP or other things like this, a lot of these things have happened in a bipartisan manner. Mm -hmm. Spectrum has been something that, I don't care if you are from a red state or a blue state, or if you're in rural or urban America, this is something that everybody needs, and you don't get to see it in physically in your hands, but the idea of spectrum and what that spectrum can provide to constituents, our customers, and others is something that's a universal need and or want. So from that perspective, yes, I am very hopeful that that is the first step of showing that there is a need for, and there is opportunity for people to work together to come to agreement on a bipartisan piece of legislation to move forward. And I'm hopeful as well, but it's not only passing legislation for a spectrum pipeline. The government, Congress, has a role of encouraging the FCC in their oversight uh, role to look at spectrum that's out there. That is low-hanging fruit that was discussed earlier. And there's two opportunities in the near term that don't require uh, spectrum authority, that don't require legislation, and that's the 12 gigahertz band that people mentioned. 1,000 megahertz of high mid-band spectrum that the FCC is considering right now, the lower five, 12.2 to 12.7, for fixed wireless service, uh, for rural areas, for tribal communities, and all it takes is updating the rules to allow for higher power two-way. So that's one opportunity where you can clear 1,000 megahertz uh, this year, maybe while WRC is going on, that doesn't require spectrum authority. The second is the CBRS band, which was mentioned. There's a lot of opportunity in that band because it's sort of sandwiched between 345 and C band at, at higher power. That band has a lot of potential, but it doesn't have certain rules of the road. Uh, it's called TDD spectrum, so uplink, downlink, it's all in one. And right now there's no rule uh, that allows carriers to deploy that spectrum knowing whether someone will do more downlink or more uplink. Well, Congress could encourage the FCC to look at the CBRS ban and improve it without requiring spectrum authority. So to us, those are short-term, imminent things that can take place by the FCC this year as we hopefully can get to a place where spectrum authority is reauthorized and we actually have real bans going into the future. 
I think, you know, enshrining these auctions into law has this amazing benefit of producing revenue for Congress to spend, right? What in DC we call a score. Um, Christine, you actually were an appropriator. I think you probably appreciate this issue more than many. Mm -hmm. um, how does that scoring process wade into the larger pipeline conversation? That scoring process is, is the secret sauce for a lot of spectrum yeah. bills in the past and in the future. Uh, it's, it's something where it, the auctions provide revenue to the federal government, whether it's for congr to spend on congressional priorities or to uh, pay down the debt. And it's, it's an instance where companies like ours are willing to come to the table and bring billions and billions of dollars uh, of revenue for the government and for Congress to decide how they want to allocate it. Um, and that, that's really intriguing for Congress, especially when they have budget targets they need to make in a reconciliation process which is not what's happening now, but in, in that instance, they're really under a lot of pressure to bring certain revenue to the table to balance the budget. And uh, it's uh, preferable, of course, to, uh, to go this route as opposed to uh, having Congress uh, raise taxes or impose new fees on industries that didn't have these fees before. So it's, it's really, like I said, the secret sauce to, uh, to getting Spectrum uh, uh, passed and signed into law. And I will note, um, for all of us at this, uh, on this uh, panel would agree that um, the more licensed spectrum that is dedicated and identified in a pipeline bill, the higher the score is. Unlicensed does not bring revenue to the table. So that's something that should always be uh, in the minds of members of Congress and senators when they're negotiating bills. And can I add one thing? Typically, it, as you just said, spectrum auctions just go to reduce the deficit. And it's important for the scoring, and I think we all agree that's beneficial. But I think Congress should seriously consider taking some of the auction revenue and use it for some important programs. We have rip and replace with a $3 billion shortfall. So carriers that have Huawei ZTE in their networks, there's not enough money to have them rip it out and replace it with trusted partners. Where is that money going to come from? We have the FCC admirably talking about how do we do next gen 911. That's billions of dollars as well. So as Congress is looking at auction authority, why not take a look? Maybe some of that money should go to important public policy priorities in telecom rather than all of it going to deficit reduction. Yeah, and, and that has <clears throat> happened in the past. Like way back to DTV, there was, part of it was, it was a part of reconciliation, so a lot went to uh, debt reduction, but then there was also, I think, like a billion dollars for interoperability, and there were some funds for E911 and for tsunami warning. Um, situation, as you can imagine, uh, with Senators Stevens and Senator Inouye negotiating the bill, that made sense. So there, there has been in the past, a and it's going to be a balance, yeah. and there's going to be uh, what they always say is in the appropriations world, uh, in this microcosm, horse trading that goes on. I have more priority in, in debt reduction. I have more priorities in some of these special projects. Uh, so it's, it's definitely something that brings the members to the table, and then they need to find that proper balance of what, what gets them to yes. So when we're putting together a pipeline bill, hopefully that happens soon, um, a lot of that spectrum that we're looking at, that mid-band, that 5G friendly spectrum, 60% uh, of it, a little over 60% is occupied right now by the federal government, and as we know, most of that by the Department of Defense. So, um, you know, it's funny, we, uh, we hosted a punch bowl event the other day, and Congressman August Pfluger said something I think that was actually right on point, which was, you cannot have a strong national defense, strong national security, without having a strong national economy. Mm -hmm. And that just really resonated me, with me, and I think, you know, a big part of a healthy U.S. economy is having a healthy wireless industry. So how does DOD play into these larger conversations about a, a pipeline. Um, we've, we've all been in offices and we've all been having these conversations. So i uh, love to get your thoughts on sort of how we navigate the DOD conversation. It's not going away. No, I think it's probably been the, uh, it's been the real tricky part of, mm -hmm. of these debates. Um, I mean, listen, I, I think there is a natural partnership that, that can occur between the wireless industry as well as DOD and, and quite frankly, you know, uh, the defense companies. And, um, you know, we just have to be able to understand um, the concerns that they have, which are, you know, normally built around weapon systems and things like that that have been planned out for many years, but also future, you know, uh, weapon systems that they need to use. But as you said, I think 
everything that all of us are doing up here helps make a lot of that work. And it's, you know, whether it's 5G or 6G or, you know, successive technologies, those are going to have an impact on, on what <laughs> DOD does and what our country does from a leadership perspective. But I, I agree, there's, there's definitely, and I think I mentioned it earlier, I think there is no separation between um, what is our economic and our national security policy. It's just busting through those barriers and getting members of the Senate Armed Services, House Armed Services, and Senate and, Senate and House uh, Commerce Committees working together. And I, you know, we have been spending a lot more time <laughs> on uh, Armed Services Committee members. Frankly, a lot more than Frank I have in the past. So we're getting to know a lot of new faces. Um, I think that's been helpful, don't you guys think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I would absolutely agree that it's been helpful. I think that uh, a lot of times when you're looking at a lot of these issues, we oftentimes are going to just our committees of jurisdiction. And I think that Spectrum has been something that has come to the forefront of just about every committee in recent years. I think I've seen it in Science, DOD, Haskell mm -hmm. Armed Services, a lot of different places. And so I think that the constant education and collaboration back and forth helps people to shape policies in such a way <laughs> that will help them make, that, make those decisions um, be fruitful for all. And I think uh, to, sort of the other part of this conversation is China. I mean, the House actually set up a select committee on the CCP just to look at the threats that China poses to the United States. And I think wireless is definitely part of that conversation. Curious if you guys think, I mean, we're spending time with the Intel committees as well. How does the China conversation, which I think is a real driver in making sure that we continue mm -hmm. to have more, con more, more access to licensed full power spectrum, um, yeah. weigh that a little bit, the China conversation? Uh, I agree. I mean, DOD uh, is embracing 5G. They're embracing Open RAN. Uh, they're looking at their facilities and how they can be secure vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Uh, I think the, the bipartisan CHIPS bill that included the Open RAN funding as an alternative uh, to Huawei and ZTE. I mean, one of the issues with uh, the Chinese vendors is they're actually high quality and they're completely subsidized by the Chinese government. So the costs are, are low. And how do we have alternatives uh, to Huawei and, and ZT, and that's why you know, DISH, we decided to deploy an open RAN network now covering 246 million folks in the United States with mostly U.S. vendors uh, as we see as an alternative to China. And I agree with Robert that, you know, it's always hard, but we've had success. Look at CBRS, look at 345. That was the government and DOD working with industry, working with CTIA to come up with solutions uh, to make successful high power, you know, for 345 and then sharing in, in CBRS, it took many years, but we can do it. Uh, and one of the things that the FCC, I think, you know, Commissioner Carr and Chairwoman Rosenworth talked about is you need to give DOD an incentive. It can't just be we're going to take it from you. Uh, you need to give them a carrot. What, what can they gain by giving up some of their spectrum? Maybe it's access to our networks. Maybe it's private 5G. Maybe it's additional security. Maybe it's AI. So through a partnership, to, rather than just saying, give me, uh, right. What do they get out of it? Uh, I think it's going to be important to figure this out. And you know, the ranking member of the Armed Services Committee in the Senate was the former chairman of the Commerce Committee in the Roger, Senate. Right. So I mean, what do you think impact it's, that has? I, I think that has, it, it's extremely helpful. Uh, those he two gets committees, it, right? those two committees there, there's a lot of overlap on, on the members as well, um, down dais, uh, which then we have um, allies that understand our network, understand the technology and the importance that we play in the economy. And as was said before, National security and economic security go hand in hand. So when we go into these offices, um, especially members that are on other committees that are interested in China, which are in addition to the Commerce Committee, and we start to tell our story about how 4G, the United States led the world. And what happened? That meant that the innovation all took place in our country and all these innovative companies, a lot who are at this uh, show um, this week, uh, we're able to bring jobs to our country and really, um, you know, all of the, uh, the information that um, they were able to, um, to put into that to, uh, to, to, I guess, innovate and create new jobs was really important. And so we don't want to see that with 5G and it, and it can be slipping away. And it, when we bring that up to members, even, even the, the DOD, you know, we, we get agreement. It's just how do we get to yes as far as the next bill? 
And the one last thing I'll say, which tags back on DOD, is and uh, they're inserting a lot more. And part of that is because spectrum is now becoming more scarce, right? We're looking at bands, and uh, we're looking at their bands. And so uh, that makes spectrum legislation more difficult for policymakers, but it also um, highlights how important this legislation is because it is so scarce, and we need to be more efficient. With you it. know, one other thing I would say, too, is a lack of a plan and a lack of a spectrum pipeline leads to this problem that we're kind of in today. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a clear laid out um, vision by both, you know, members on the Hill and, you know, the administration and everybody else, it, you know, we know spectrum's a finite resource, but that lack of scarcity, uh, the, the scarcity and then the lack of planning gets you to a point where everybody's fighting over it, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And then I'd say the second thing, and I think it was mentioned on a couple panels earlier, is, you know, this is the reason why NTIA was, cr was created. Mm -hmm. NTIA was created in order to be able to be the representative of the federal government on all spectrum issues and then coordinate in consultation with the FCC as well as the industry. And that process needs to be preserved because the minute it's not, you get into all these external fights that happen on spectrum, it's just not helpful. So I, I know some of the previous panelists at the NTIA and Commissioner Starks and everybody else would, would agree with that, but it, yeah, I think that's an important point to make. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, I think the va one of the big values of a pipeline is the fact that Congress is saying, this is the direction we're going. And it takes those C-band kind of debates off the table, the 24 gigahertz conversations off the table. Um, and I think there's real value in that. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, let's pivot to the ACP. Uh, this is one we've all been spending a whole lot of time on Capitol Hill talking about. Um, we, as has been said a number of times, we're getting close to 21 million households uh, relying on the ACP, which is pretty amazing, and that number is just growing every single day. Uh, set to run out of funding uh, the first half of next year. We're thinking like April, May time frame, which is right around the corner. Um, but we've seen also some really good bipartisan support for extending the ACP, both in the House and the Senate. So I'm curious how you guys see the ACP playing out at the end of the year. Again, pull out that crystal ball. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, listen, here's what we know about ACP is it's working, yes, right? It's yes. working and it's, it's doing a great job. It's connecting people that it was meant to, to help. The interesting thing is it really shouldn't be you know, partisan, it, should, it is bipartisan. Obviously it was passed in a bipartisan way, but the frustration, it's like anything else we're dealing with right now is, is lack of total engagement all the way around kind of 360 and figuring out, okay, how do we make sure we don't run out of funding? The, the interesting thing is if you look at current take rates, for example, if you look at, um, you know, uh, districts in Kentucky, I can show you an R plus 30 district, very Republican, that has a 35% take rate. On the flip side, I can take you to New York City and show you a D plus 20 district that has a 25, 30% take rate, right? So this is impacting, you know, red districts, blue districts, and everything in between. So I think it's been really been one of education and mm -hmm. talking to members and making sure they understand how it's impacting their state. It's impacting rural America. It's impacting, you know, urban America, and it's doing a lot of good. So the problem is we just have to try to figure out, okay, what can we agree to to get that funding extended to make sure that we are um, living up to the commitment that we made because having that drop and just end, and I know that, again, many panelists and had talked about this before. I know Commissioner Starks talked about it. Um, and, and I think there's some really good discussions that are now occurring between the industry uh, and Congress and the White House. And I know there was a call yesterday. I participated in a White, Ho White House call yesterday, and I was very encouraged by the engagement that we're having there now. So, um, again, I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to get to some resolution. But, um, again, it's not going to be an easy task. Yeah, I mean, we're looking at, you know, a potential shutdown in as right. soon as four days. Um, sort of how that whole spending conversation comes together at the end of the year, I think nobody really knows the answer to that. Um, how do you all think ACP plays into that? I mean, uh, imagine what would happen if 21 million people, and as Robert said, this is blue state, red state Households. issues. I mean, Households. Like 50 so million, 50 million right? people yeah. losing access to connectivity. And what we're seeing uh, through our, our Boost brand is many times this is their only form of connectivity. They can't necessarily afford Comcast. Uh, so that connection on their mobile device is it for school, for education, for jobs. Imagine what the phone calls 
<laughs> uh, if 50 million people are reaching out to Congress. And unfortunately, I think we will be blamed. Customers will be, wait, why did you shut, why did you shut me off? Uh, this subsidy is so important uh, for them. And I think those who care about it on the Hill uh, understand that. It's just given some of the challenges, I don't think it will be this year, unfortunately. I think it yeah. will be right before it expires. Yeah. Um, <laughs> or God forbid, yeah. you know, it expires and then everyone is calling and then right. they'll r resume. Uh, but I'm very worried about it. Uh, when a program is this successful, helping this many people, uh, but requires legislation to actually mm -hmm. keep it going. Well, it not only requires legislation, but requires a money. lot of money, a yes. lot of money to go with that legislation. <laughs> right. uh, and and I, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. As as is human nature, probably pretty much everybody in the room. Congress is the same. Uh, operates <laughs> at best under a deadline. Right. That's what we're seeing right now. Uh, this week with the government shutdown, but uh, equally with this, uh, you know, in our minds, we're we're thinking ahead. Um, but uh, as you mentioned, Kelly, it's next year when this deadline might happen, and, and we know there's a lot of other deadlines in front of it, the ACP deadline that Congress needs to address as well. So, uh, so hopefully, uh, all the advocacy we're doing will uh, will build and build, and we'll be able to, you know, um, bring some stories to uh, um, to the Hill to really. That, that will resonate with, uh, with the members. I, I will say that, and, and I know that we would all agree with this, that the COVID lockdown, which is where this originated, of course, um, really showed everyone in our country how important a connection is uh, to families, especially a wireless connection. Uh, so um, the thought that some the most vulnerable would be uh, disconnected from that uh, is, is a compelling and, um, point to make. I've been incredibly heartened by the fact that we're seeing all these bipartisan letters mm -hmm. come out of the Absolutely. House from the World Broadband Caucus, the uh, Problem Solvers Caucus, the Tri Caucus. Mm -hmm. um, I know all of us on the stage have been a part of, you know, getting folks on those letters. But mm -hmm. anything you want to add, Katrice? And I would also add. I mean, the Senate has also yeah, had its right. um, its display of uh, bipartisanship in this yep. space too. And I think that that's. I think. I don't want to add any more to this because I think everything has been well said here. I think there's a sense of urgency that this needs to get done. I think it's an important tool and benefit for a lot of customers and constituents um, throughout the country. And I just hope it's something that we can find a way to get it. Yeah, continued. and listen, you know, Jeff, I mean, Jeff's not wrong. Christine's not wrong. I mean, Congress does operate on deadlines all the time, which is, you know, it just is what it is. But um, <laughs> I, I think that here's the problem. If we don't get funding done this year, you're now going off appropriation cycle and what becomes the vehicle that has to carry exactly somewhere probably what is, I would say maybe between four and a half, depending on who you talk to, right? How much money you're asking for, four and a half billion to eight billion. What vehicle carries that when you're in the middle of March or April? That becomes in an very, election year. In, in an election exactly. year, it, it becomes almost impossible, which is why the, the time is now mm -hmm. to get that done. And I think it's really important. And I know all of us are really pushing very hard to make that happen for our customers. So. Well, it's great to see White House engagement. Hill's clearly in a good, well, mostly a good place. We're getting good conversations out of that. Yeah. Um, net neutrality, <laughs> Title II. I mean, like, the timing was perfect, right? Like, I love that we're doing our panel today. Um, this was a great this was a, yeah, <laughs> You're having a really good time. Eight minutes left. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, I mean, I do think it's interesting. This has been something, I mean, many of us have been working on this issue for almost over a decade now. Um, we know it inside and out. Almost, or two. Almost, yeah, for too long. Years. For too long. Years. Um, I, every year that goes by, I, I want to say it, be, it should become more likely that there's a legislative solution here, because I do think there could be a legislative solution. Um, what do you guys think? I, I, I'll just start out by, I'm laughing seeing Robert sitting here on, on the stage because <laughs> it, I remember when net neutrality first became an issue and it was when I was working in Senate Commerce and Robert was working for Verizon at the time and we were trying to do a telecom rewrite uh, with the cornerstone of a franchise reform and net neutrality inserted itself as, as an urgent issue that needed to be resolved. We tried to put down some principles and, and, put, and codify them and it wasn't enough. So. Away we went, and you know, the FCC did what they did. The FCC did something else. The FCC did something else. Um, and so I think what the, the lesson to be learned is it would be really nice if policymakers feel like this is something that needs to be addressed, that it be codified, uh, as opposed to 
regulated where the pendulum swings back and forth depending on the White House um, that has control. If this were a, if, if net neutrality were an Olympic sport, right, <laughs> this would be the world's longest consecutive ping pong game yep. um, yeah. of just back and forth that literally never ends. Yeah. And so I agree. I mean, listen, the, the, the solution is, is bipartisan, you know, congressional legislation that really deals with this issue for once and for all. Um, I mean, and I, Senator Wicker and Senator Sinema yes. are, you know, yeah. they've got their own working group in the yeah. Senate. Yeah, and, and, and it, it's possible, you know, I, I was, we were talking earlier, I think over lunch and, you know, talking about, you know, years back when we were doing uh, the internet tax moratorium, right? That was a thing that just kept on getting mm -hmm. kind of ping ponged around and we would do two years extension here and two here and then four here and then it became seven and finally we made it permanent, right? It just takes a lot of, you know, uh, buy-in from all parties to say, okay, we really have to do this. You can't necessarily, in my opinion, um, blame, you know, each and every FCC, right? They're kind of just doing what they think is right uh, at the time, and it's lack of congressional intent and direction. And so um, you can't put the blame on anybody. If the blame's going to be on anybody, it needs to be on everybody to just finally say, we've got all got to get together you know, industry, all, all players in the industry, government, everybody sit down and write some common sense legislation that gets it done once and for all. And not everyone knows this, but in 2012, we were so close yes, mm -hmm. right. to a congressional solution on net neutrality with public interest groups and industry, and it just fell apart at, at the last minute. Yeah. But it was led by uh, Congressman Waxman, uh, and I remember the text was there, and it was on the verge. Yeah and it didn't happen, and that's unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. And I will also yeah. add that like, when we were first dealing with net neutrality, and we were all dealing with it in some form, whether in the private sector or public sector at the time, I think the internet was sort of in a different phase of its life. I think that how the internet has progressed, how companies have managed their networks, and how things mm -hmm. are yeah. happening right now, when we're going into these discussions in the future, there is more experience and more information that we can bring to the table Absolutely. on all sides. And hopefully that will help us come to mm -hmm. a conclusion that is something that's going to be beneficial and satisfactory for all. Yeah, and and, and it goes without thing. saying, by the way, that like, every company sitting up here supports all the those principles. concepts yeah. and yes. the principles of net neutrality and getting it done, right? right. And, and so that's... And we're doing them without... Yeah, that's not know, the issue. Without legislation. You know? we're, yeah. Without regulation right yeah. now. But I agree also that, you know, all of the experience we've had over the years is going to hopefully lend trust that when we, when we do all get to the table, hopefully, uh, that we can show how we can manage our networks in a responsible way to protect our consumers because the last thing we want to do is to have our consumers harmed because then they're just going to go somewhere else. Right. Okay, we're ending on a lightning round. We've got four minutes left, so we'll see if we can run down the clock here. Um, because you all are the legislative experts, we're going to ask about a government shutdown. Oh Is it happening? <laughs> Robert. Unfortunately, yes. Catrice. I think yes, although there were rumors in the paper that I haven't seen in the last hour saying that they may have some solution, but I don't believe that to be the case. There will be no government shutdown. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Again, Mr. Optimist over here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Senate will pass. The CR will go over. Yeah. There will be you know, a deal in the House, and we won't shut down. Everybody will be reasonable. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Christine? Unfortunately, yes, but hopefully just for a brief time. For those of you who think there will be a government shutdown, how long will it last? Oh, gosh. Hopefully short. I think, I think short. I think mm -hmm. short. short? Define short. <laughs> a week to 10 days. OK. I will say this. If I actually knew the answer to that question, I'd go buy a lottery ticket right <laughs> yeah. now and play it because I'm really smart. And I'm not. <laughs> Christine? Uh, I'm thinking maybe two weeks. Okay, gosh, okay, that all seems very optimistic. I'm not that optimistic. Um, so, uh, sort of similar to Amer's panel, I'm kind of curious, uh, we want to end on a high note here. It's called a vibe shift. A vibe, th yeah, thank you, a vibe, vibe shift. shift. Vibe, vibe pivot. Uh, most exciting 5G sort of app that you utilize or uh, technology that you're excited about. Um, we spend so much time on Capitol Hill talking about sort of what's in the future. I'm curious sort of what it is you guys are selling on the Hill. We'll start with Christine. We'll go yeah. this way. T-Mobile Tuesday. 
<laughs> no, just kidding. Um, I, I really love all the different fitness apps. They're all so creative and have different you know, strengths depending on what your, your fitness is. And it's just, I enjoy experimenting with the different apps. And I agree, fixed wireless, I think, could be the killer 5G app. But like, wouldn't it be great to have like a Zoom call where you see the person uh, in 3D, like full 4K quality? Um, and whether that's 5G or, or 6G, so I think Barbara from Ericsson was saying holograms. holograms but like, that could be the killer app if you could just you know, see you know, someone, uh, like what they look like in real life. Um, but that takes a lot of bandwidth and a lot of spectrum. So mine will be an evolution, and I'm paying homage to my niece, um, who I adore and love. First and foremost, I do not know any name of any song whatsoever, so wow. Shazam is going to save my life <laughs> for that go. purpose. But <laughs> as we're looking to the future, I want to be able to maybe have a dance party with my niece with some 5G holo or 6G yeah. holograms. So the evolution of how an app can kind of get us there, I think, is exciting to me. I love that. <laughs> Yeah, we, well, Verizon just announced we just did a test with some hologram stuff, so it's oh. kind of cool. Um, I agree with that. It could be killer. I don't know what it means for my children, though. That Because, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I guess the killer, well, I'm going to say killer app that I love right now, and it's um, the button on my phone that I'm able to just end the internet in my house and watch my kids just go ballistic. Yeah, the kill switch. And every time I hit it, you know, I can hear, like, I'm like, I literally go three, two, one, Dad, the internet's out again. No, it's not. I just turned it off. And, um, so that's my killer app at the moment. I love it. That's I love good. It. Well, thank you all for participating. So happy you guys could make it out to Vegas. And we will hand it over to the next stage participant. Thank you. Thank you.